Good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you find yourself. Welcome to this CSIS event. I'm Scott Kennedy, Senior Advisor and Trustee Chair in Chinese Business and Economics at CSIS, and I'm delighted to uh, host today's event about China's economy. Has the crisis started? Anybody who's been watching uh, China for the last uh, year plus has recognized that China's economy has not performed how many thought it would after the pandemic ended. It's been much more of a struggle. And there's been some good news with regard to electric vehicles and some other areas of high tech. But most of the news coming out of China has been far less positive, much more negative. Uh, the data on China's growth that they reported for 20. 23 has been uh, claimed a suspect by many observers. Uh, fixed asset investment rose some, uh, but not as far as people wanted. And consumption, China's international trade investment data has not looked as good as people were expecting. Uh, China on Monday will open its annual legislative session where people are expecting an announcement regarding China's policies going forward that are going to be meant to address the concerns of domestic investors and businesses, consumers, as well as the international community. I'm joined today by a stellar panel of experts to evaluate where China's economy is and what we can expect in the rest of 2024. I'm going to introduce them now, and then I'm going to offer them an opening question. Uh, and then we're going to have a discussion. Uh, you watching can go to CSIS.org to this event page and submit your own questions as well to this group. And we will get to your questions in the second half of the hour. So let me introduce uh, the lineup that we have today. I really am absolutely delighted to be joined first uh, by Stephen Barnett, who is a senior, the senior rep resident representative in China for the International <laughs> Monetary Fund. He has spent much of his career covering Asia, including serving as chief of the China division, assistant director at the IMF office for Asia and the Pacific in Tokyo, resident representative in China, resident representative in Thailand. Prior to joining the IMF in 1997, he earned his PhD in economics from the University of Maryland. Logan Wright is director of China Markets research at Rhodium, and he's also a non-resident with us here in the trustee chair. And he focuses on the impact of China's credit expansion on its financial system, its exchange rate policies, the influence of China on global currency and capital markets. Uh, Logan has his PhD from GW. We were classmates. Uh, he's now based in DC mm -hmm. after living and working in Beijing and Hong Kong for over two decades. Yen Mei Xie is a geopolitical analyst at GavCal. She tracks China's political economy, China's technology, industrial and trade competition with other industrialized economies, and the economic impact of other geopolitically significant events. Yen Mei is a tri-continental resident, having lived, studied, and worked in Beijing, Washington, and Hong Kong, now resides in Spain. Kyoyuki Suguchi is research director at the Cannon Institute for Global Studies. His research focuses on the Chinese economy, U.S., China, Japan, trilateral relations. He previously worked for the Bank of Japan from 1982 to 2009, including chief representative in Beijing from 2006 to 2008. Mr. Suguchi was also an international visiting fellow at RAND from 2004 to 2005. And finally, but not least, Yunus Yun is CNBC's Beijing bureau chief. Prior to joining CNBC, she worked as an anchor and correspondent with CNN reporting from China, as well as the rest of the region. She has been in Beijing through thick and thin, weathered the entire <laughs> pandemic there under uh, very no. conditions. And she's reported <laughs> on every aspect of China's exit from the pandemic, pandemic and its windy economic path since. Thank each of you 
for being with us today. So I'm going to ask you all to respond to the same question in the order in which I originally introduced you. Is China in the early stages of a deep economic crisis? Or is it just slightly deeper and more problematic than usual? Uh, or is everyone absolutely exaggerating the data uh, and, and misdiagnosing what the problems are? So let's start uh, with uh, Stephen uh, from the IMF. What's your view of China's uh, current economic circumstances? Great. Well, first off, let me thank you and thank CSIS for inviting me here. I was really excited for this event, and this is really a great, great question. So, uh, you know, I have around three to four minutes. I'm, I'm going to give you a funny answer. My answer is going to be a, a parable. I think the Chinese economy right now is like the elephant in the parable of the blind man and the elephant. You know, I, if you go to the, the West, to the U.S. or, you know, to D.C., you talk to people, the economy is sick. The elephant is sick. It's about to have a crisis. Everything is falling apart. Then you come back to Beijing. You talk to policymakers here. You say everything is fine. We targeted growth last year of around five. We had growth of you know five point two percent. I think in this environment, it's really hard to have a balanced view as to what's happening in the economy to try to see the whole elephant. There's clearly truth to what everybody is saying. They're just touching different parts of this economy. So. Uh, since I can't have the main answer be a parable, let me give some some context. I'll also, give our view. You know, the fund's view is growth this year will be four point six percent, coming down from five point two last year. But I think we need to look at three factors. First is the global context. You know, we've characterized the global recovery as resilient, but slow. What do we mean by slow? We have global growth this year at three point one percent. It was three point one percent last year. Prior to the pandemic, the two decades prior to the pandemic, global growth was 3.8% on average. So 3.1% is slow. That's what we mean by slow. And this is an, a global economy that has scarring. So the level of GDP is still below the pre-pandemic trend. So that's, I think, factor one when we look at China. Factor two is real estate in China. You know, the Chinese real estate sector is going under undergoing a very large and necessary adjustment. And we estimate that real estate accounted for about one-fifth of value added if you kind of go upstream and downstream. We estimate that supply was running about 35 to 55 percent ahead of underlying demand. So you needed a correction in, in production of residential real estate on the order of 35 to 55 percent. We've seen a lot of that already. If we look at uh, sales, they're down about 40% from their peak. If we look at starts, they're down around 60% from their, their peak. Of course, there's been a buildup of inventory, so it's still going to take a while for this to happen. But here we've had a big adjustment, still ongoing, and a big part of the economy, yet growth last year was 5.2%. And we expect growth this year to be 4.6%, even with the continued adjustment in real estate. You know, I think in my, my last point, is if we look at the medium term forecast for China. So again, the fund, we are 5.2% last year. We forecast 4.6% this year, 4.1% next year, and 3.5% over the medium term. Now, the government thinks our 3.5% medium term growth is way too low. And I should clarify for the fund, the medium term is five years. So when I say medium term, I'm going out uh, five years in the future. Uh, we hope the government's right. We hope it's lower. Growth certainly could be higher than three and a half percent with the right kind of policies. But I would emphasize that three and a half percent growth in the medium term, China's performance would be exactly average for a country at that income level. So basically China would be moving from decades of really being a star performer, growing much faster than peers at similar income based on our medium forecast to an average performer. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Super, thank you, Stephen, for getting us going. Uh, Logan, over to you, uh, the elephant. What what's when you when you put your hands out and reach out? What kind of animal do you find? Thanks, Scott. No animal analogies, but I love the uh, original framing of the question. Where you know, there's this old joke: if you put a a question in the headline, the answer is usually no, right? And so, uh, you know, if if uh, if the question is like, has the crisis started? Um, I have a sort of different answer to that. Uh, that which is that we're not at the start of a crisis in China. We're in the middle of a crisis in China. Uh, and a crisis started long ago. It started with 
uh, basically the end of an unprecedented credit and investment expansion that has had that has emerged where uh, now it's possible to have widespread defaults and losses on Chinese financial instruments. And that's played out primarily through a decline in the property sector, primarily through a decline in local government investment and the increasingly obvious constraints on China's credit system and on monetary and fiscal policy, which are revealed right now in terms of how they're working around uh, their traditional channels using very unconventional measures uh, to try to shore up the economy at this point. And I can elaborate on that. But you know, at the start of a financial crisis, or at the start of a banking crisis, uh, you bail out everyone. So you always say that everything is a one-off problem and that we just need to sort of get through this. In the middle of a crisis, which is where we are now, and you start to limit the government's liability because everyone is concerned that this is a broader problem and therefore it's gonna overwhelm the government's balance sheet to bail out all LGFEs, to bail out all property developers, to bail out all of the distressed banks. You have to start to limit um, those government obligations. That's where we are now. And the problem, I, in my view, is the quality of economic policymaking that's out there at this stage. Um, it's on critical issues for the future of the economy, when we're looking at how to manage local government debt, when we're looking at how to manage uh, unfinished buildings in the property sector, the medium-term fiscal sustainability challenges, China's very low proportion of tax revenue, which was acknowledged in the IMS uh, Article 4 consultations recently. You know, the government is just silent right now. They're not really saying anything other than we're going to address these problems. And most people like to say that China has tons of fiscal space, that w these are internal problems. We're just waiting for, this is a left pocket, right pocket problem. That's exactly what we are waiting for. We are waiting for the evidence of whose pockets are going to be raided, whose are going to be filled. And it's not happening at this stage. And as a result, you have, China has very few options to generate growth using its old drivers as long as this system remains sort of in this intermediate uh, crisis oriented state. We can speculate about why policymaking is different, um, why it's in terms of the concentration of political power. But what we can say clearly is that this is very different than traditional Chinese patterns uh, of technocratic policymaking, where at least there were policies announced and we could debate their effectiveness and what China was going to do about uh, what was China was going to do about them. At the same time, right now, if you look in the narrower context of growth, uh, within the context of this structural slowdown in growth, China's cyclical data, in our view, are likely to improve a bit this year, not to slow down from from last year. And things may not feel that much better, but the data are probably going to look a bit better. And this is in part, and this is where I think um, you know this question of the reliability of the data comes in. This is in part because the severity of the downturn in 2022 and 2023 has been underappreciated and hasn't been acknowledged within the official data or within official rhetoric. The property sector, as Steve acknowledged, was 20 to 25 percent of value added. It has collapsed. Uh, starts are down 60 percent. Uh, sales are down by similar margins. Nothing else emerged to offset that. Um, and so that's the the challenge in understanding you know where we're where we're operating from at this point. There are arguments out there that private sector investment you know somehow offset the decline in the property sector's investment. I can walk through I can walk through those, but those are really unsubstantiated based on listed company data, based on construction activity, other measures of industrial production that show basically you know no growth. So we think growth this year will pick up modestly from what 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 it was last year at around one and a half to two percent in 2023 to around three three and a half percent in 2024, and that's mostly because the property sector has already declined so much, and you're already starting to see land purchases come back from state-owned developers. Uh, consumption growth is likely to remain roughly in line with last year's levels or in, in line with income growth, which is consistent with the high-frequency data you're seeing out of the Chinese New Year holiday. And you know this can happen in the context of structural slowdowns. People forget that in Japan's structural slowdown, Japan was you know one of the fastest growing economies in the OECD in 1995 and 1996 before financial pressures you know caused a further decline. That's the kind of rebound or the scale of the rebound we're sort of expecting this year. This will change the narrative a bit, but you know one of the key stories this year will be China's exports uh, to the rest of the world, particularly in electric vehicles, solar panels, sectors that have benefited from. Uh, Chinese industrial policy. Um, the politics of external imbalances are going to come back this year, would be our expectation. And unless the world sees a significant rise in China's imports and a narrowing of the trade surplus, um, I think it'll be difficult to, for Beijing to make the case that the economy is stabilizing meaningfully. So I'll stop there, but that's uh, that's how we're seeing it. 
Well, Logan, thank you very much. And I think we've already uh, identified a little bit of difference in the analysis of, of, of what's been going on. I don't want to overly put my spin on and read on them, but um, I think you're saying that China is in the middle of a crisis and uh, trying to find a, a way out, but hasn't identified it clearly. Uh, Stevens identified a variety of problems, uh, but still sees a pathway towards uh, reasonable growth over the medium term. Yan Mei, where do you fall down in this on this issue? Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, so when you pose the question about whether China has entered a deep crisis, when I think of crisis, I think of the kind of spasm that the U.S. experienced following the great financial crisis in 20, uh, 20, 2008 or the Japanese-style real estate state bust leading to economy-wide prolonged recession and stagnation. Right? So I think today's China definitely has elements of resemblance to each case but not enough to really turn into either one of them. I think that both Stephen and um, Logan identified that China has reached a moment of structural reckoning. Uh, the real estate sector, which has been 25% you know, of the Chinese economy, has reached its peak. It's coming down, uh, and it's not returning to the boom. And it's happening at a very inconvenient time. It's happening when the rest of the economy has been struggling out of the COVID doldrum and then struggling out has been lacking vigor. Um, and that said, I think the government has saw this coming, it has saw the real estate sector downsizing coming years ago, and it has done an okay job of one, identifying where the risks are um, and try to limit the growth of the risks and also try to segregate them. Therefore, a real estate downturn plus you know, some of the uh, crisis in the financial sectors, the local government balance sheets, won't incinerate the entire economy like in some other countries. Okay? So, um, but that said, so th I, I don't see that kind of like very big um, uh, spectacular crisis happening in China. That said, I very much agree with the, the structural, uh, you know, slowdown uh, moment uh, in China. Um, and I think, um, you know, when, the, when the, the, the property sector now is, it has reached it, its peak, I just don't see another growth engine to replace it. I don't see any other sector to, to, to fill the space. So the Chinese government is banking a lot on industrial and technological sectors to pick up the slack. You know, the electronics, vehicles, machinery, green energy, et cetera. Um, but these sectors are not likely to grow as big as real estate to pick up the slack relative to the Chinese economy. Also, the, the Chinese consumers have been pretty timid in their spending, but even if they regain their former swagger, there's only so much appliances they can buy, and they are not going to buy a bunch of capital equipment. So that will leave the rest of the world to buy all those industrial manufactured goods to, to, you know, to cons consume the Chinese manufactured goods. And then the rest of the world particularly the developed countries, industrialized countries, are becoming increasingly fearful of deindustrialization by cheap Chinese manufactured goods, and they are setting up protectionist walls. Um, the U.S. keeps adding to its walls, and Europe is now looking to build its protectionist walls. So I think the, the appetite for uh, you know, Chinese goods is diminishing in the rest of the world. Uh, so to sum it up, I don't see a spectacular crisis happening in China, but I do see China continue to struggle or deal with a period of low growth, sluggish demand, both internally and externally. I do see overcapacity, and I do see pretty persistent deflationary pressure uh, in China. Terrific. I think now we've got what I would call a spectrum of views, which is very good. And since Yan Mei touched upon uh, the Japanese challenges of the 1990s. And since it's very uh, appropriate that we turn to Suguchi-san next, uh, who's from Tokyo, but uh, one of the world's best analysts of the Chinese economy. How do you see uh, and analyze what's going on in, in China right now, Suguchi-san? Um, uh, my view is also uh, um, similar to Yen san uh, I, I also don't think uh, now Chinese economy is not crisis. But uh, on the way, on the process of structural slowdown uh, in nineteen uh, in 2020s, uh, in my view, uh, <clears throat> the uh, era of the uh, high economic growth ended 
uh, in uh, 2021. Uh, it started uh, since the 1980s, uh, but uh, there are many reasons uh, 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 to stop that. Um, originally, uh, we expected uh, that uh, around 2025, uh, there are four structural problems. One is population aging, uh, decrease in working, aging, uh, working age population. Second, uh, slowdown of urbanization. Third, uh, decrease in infrastructure building, large scale in infrastructure building. Fourth, deterioration of performance of SOEs. Uh, because of those, uh, so uh, we expected um, Chinese economy, it, uh, the era of the uh, high economic growth end uh, in ar around 2025. But uh, before that, uh, three or four years earlier than that, it ended in 2021 because uh, we found uh, new added uh, uh, seven uh, negative impacts. One is serious uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, um, stagnation in uh, real estate market. The second, uh, downward pressure uh, of the uh, um, 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 uh, downward pressure of the economy uh, due to uh, zero COVID-19 policy. A third, uh, decrease uh, uh, of uh, investment appetite, uh, especially in private sector under uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, shared prosperity pro uh, policy. A a and fourth, uh, unemployment uh, rate, uh, high, uh, increasing un unemployment rate uh, in younger gen younger generation. And fifth, uh, <clears throat> popular uh, de uh, decrease uh, population decrease uh, uh, in 2022 uh, uh, 850,000 people decrease and uh, last year 2.08 million people decreased uh, in population six US China friction uh, especially about semiconductor industry seventh um, <clears throat> global economic slowdown um, because there are uh, um, seven new added uh, uh, f negative impact uh, to the Chinese economy. So uh, it, uh, the rapid growth age ended uh, in 2021. So the situation of the uh, current Chinese economy is very different uh, from uh, um, before the uh, uh, COVID-19 era. Uh, and um, when I visited uh, um, uh, Beijing, Shanghai uh, in, in January, I found uh, there are big divergence uh, between economic indicators and business uh, sentiment. Uh, there are three reasons uh, uh, to, uh, to causing those uh, big uh, divergence. One is um, mis uh, uh, what to say, a misallocation of uh, policies. Uh, Chinese government uh, demanded uh, SOEs to increase their production uh, in order to make good figure uh, in, in, in 2023. So uh, production, uh, excessive production happened and excessive inventory increased. So uh, many people, uh, many companies face a decrease of uh, profit uh, and they, uh, uh, they, uh, th they think um, um, they, they cannot uh, make money in 2024. So they uh, restrict their production investment Employ, em, employment in this year. Uh, this is uh, one thing. Second one is, uh, 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 as, as other members mentioned, slowdown of, uh, 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 sorry, uh, um, serious stagnation in a um, uh, uh, real estate market. Third one is um, um, neg um, negative impact to uh, business uh, confidence in uh, private sector. Uh, there are three reasons. Uh, 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 very si significant uh, at present. So oh, they cannot recover uh, business sentiment, uh, I stop here. Okay, thank you very much. So Eunice, you've been on the ground throughout uh, during what Suguchi-san called the high growth period as well as through mm -hmm. the pandemic and the post uh, pandemic period. Uh, from your perspective, do, with all the reporting that you have done, what, how do you sum up the uh, China's current uh, circumstances and the direction of the economy? Well, for me, the crisis is in confidence. So the idea that uh, China is in an economic downturn right now is common knowledge here. Um, in my conversations, uh, people are scared to put their money anywhere else other than the bank. 
Uh, there are um, folks who want to have a good life and they, they see, you know, they, they, they know what, what living a good life is. They want to do it, but they want to do it more cheaply. So they're looking for ways to um, cut back on spending. Uh, VCs are doing deals, but they are scrutinizing those deals uh, because they don't want to take on more losses, but also because they don't want to run into national security concerns. So, um, you know, Scott, as you mentioned, um, I was here in China throughout the three years of the zero COVID controls. And during that time, um, the hope and the expectation was that uh, once the COVID controls ended, that life would return to normal. And uh, life didn't return to normal. Um, I think a big part of that is the trauma uh, that we saw here because of the zero COVID controls. Um, another part is because of some uh, some new issues, such as like the, the anti-spying campaign, for example, or some of the geopolitical tensions uh, that we saw. So that was trying to create other uncertainties. Uh, but then there were the long-standing issues that everybody else on this panel has been discussing that really seem to be resonating right now. So um, earlier this week, I went to the city of Nantong to do a story on the um, the overbuilding in the property sector. It's a prime example of that. And um, the local projections were that it would take at least five years to work through all the unsold homes. And that's making a lot of assumptions about the pace of sales. So um, that's uh, what we're seeing is just that the, the problems um, from the, the lack of market reforms and and these other issues and imbalances within the China growth model are really um, being highlighted. And in the meantime, uh, people are waiting for government action and they're still waiting. And no one exactly knows, I think, um, whether or not the government is inclined to, to do more and in, in what way. And uh, in the meantime, of course, um, everyone I know knows somebody who has lost a job or who is currently working overtime to try to keep their job and just yesterday, I was speaking to one Chinese investor to say, oh, you're putting your money. And um, that investor said to me, um, Eunice, didn't you know that 2024 is the year to save? And, and that just told me that, that people here are voting uh, with their money. Well, so I want to uh, stay on this question of, of confidence, Eunice and, and everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you all for your, your, your opening reactions uh, to, to, the, to the question. Um, you know, having talked to some private Chinese business people and consumers myself during my various trips, I don't have the, the opportunities that Eunice does, but I also encountered a great deal of pessimism. Um, I was just at a conference of international institutional investors uh, in Miami earlier this week, and uh, the level of confidence in China's trajectory, trajectory was, was as low as I've ever, ever seen it. Um, and I think you just find that in lots, if you look at the surveys of different uh, chambers of commerce about uh, plans for additional investment, uh, those seem to be as low as ever. Uh, cons consideration of moving some of one's production from China higher uh, than ever. Um, and, and so I'm curious to get, try to unpack this question of co confidence. It, to what extent is this being generated by these type of structural factors that that you all have have mentioned, um, China's demographics, uh, the uh, overhang of a real estate sector, uh, or to what extent is this about just the confidence in uh, the current leadership and the policy mix that they have? It, it's not that they have done nothing. Uh, there have been a whole variety of policies announced. But as but Logan suggested that it's just been eerily silent, and so I'm curious to what extent these are sort of structural issues, which regardless of leadership, people would be anxious about, uh, and to what extent it, it's it's really about the team in Beijing and people's concerns about what they want to do. I'm going to go back through the the group in the in the first order, but I may mix things up as we get. Uh, back to, to the next question. So Stephen, over to you. Sure, I think you know, on the, the question of confidence, let me again go to some global context, because it is true that consumer confidence in China is low if you look at the survey data. But what we find is consumer confidence in a lot of economies is below pre-pandemic levels. Even in the US, where there's been a very strong consumption recovery, 
kind of when you compare the trend lines, it is true that it's a bit weaker in China, but I think that's been a characteristic of this global recovery from a pandemic is that confidence has been uh, slow to recover. In the same time, if we look at the private investment data in China, and if we strip out real estate, which is important because we know real estate, so private investment in manufacturing has been quite strong. So there's this disconnect. I, I share your sentiment. We hear investors uh, not being optimistic. And then we look at the data and private investment is one of the fastest growing uh, components. But I, I, you know, I, I would conclude with, we clearly see space for the government to do more. It's done stuff to address real estate, but it could do more to accelerate the restructuring in real estate, to you know, accelerate the exit of unviable property developers, more quickly repair uh, the balance sheet of, of viable ones. You know, I can walk through those real estate kind of classic macro policy, there's space to do more on fiscal policy. They could provide more support to households, you know, less investment spending. This would boost confidence, boost activity. There's room for more monetary easing. And I think all of these things would support confidence, but I'd almost say all these things would support activity. And as activity picks up, you know, confidence will also follow. Sure. Logan, uh, what's the source of the crisis of confidence? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I to me, Scott, I think that the, in many confidence does matter. Um, consumer confidence is relevant for spending activity. Business confidence is re is is relevant um, in terms of you know where private investment is going to come from. But it is a I, I'm not sure that it's necessarily the primary cause of uh, China's current uh, dilemma, which is that um, this is a problem for consumers of the low rate of income growth. This is a problem for uh, producers and for for businesses of the availability of credit, which is entering you know a longer term structural decline, and this is exactly where you get to uh, this dilemma where the official data, if you look at the investment data, says there is no confidence problem. The official data says that private investment is surging very strongly, and that uh, private sector borrowing, especially for heavy industrial uh, sectors, is is surging as well. And I think that's very difficult to square with uh, with what's happening on the ground. And, and that's one of the reasons we're very skeptical that anything uh, last year was meaningful enough to offset the decline um, in the decline in the property sector. If you look at China's savings uh, savings rate or the pockets of savings uh, of China's very high level of national savings overall, and there's a lot of good work that's been done on this. Um, yes, there's a high level of precautionary savings for households overall. But generally, those savings are concentrated in three big pockets, high net worth individuals, which is an issue everywhere in the world, state owned enterprises, which is a basic distributional or governance issue because they have monopoly or oligopoly rents, and then private businesses that are basically excluded from the financial system and are sort of self-financing so that they're not necessarily, um, you know, that they can't necessarily rely upon credit. So they have to basically save in order to, to finance their own investment. Um, if the idea is that confidence needs to address those pools of savings, policy can do a lot to generate to to change that as well. And the obvious uh, category here is that that's that screams out for action is some sort of demand side support for household incomes, which revolves a fiscal transfer from the central government to individual households to facilitate spending. I mean, there's many reasons that that's been cited that China either won't do this or cannot do it. I don't think that. Um, you know, any of those are really that persuasive, but that's the most obvious, I think, uh, area where we would be looking for policy that would meaningfully make a difference in this sort of uh, consumer confidence problem at the very least. Yeah, and Mays, do you agree with Logan that that's where the, the emphasis needs to be, less on the recognition of the structural problems, but really on what the policy mix is going to be to be to stimulate demand a lot more than has been done already? I'll pick it up from there, from Loken's recommendation that, that the, the government really need to do more to stimulate the demand. I think that, that seems to be very obvious to a lot of observers, especially observers from outside. I have my theory on why the government does not do that. Uh, one, I think the Chinese government being sort of a Lenin state has a habit of using centralized mobilization. Uh, and it's kind of just like, it's against the incident of this demand uh, stimulus, which is by definition, you know, letting consumers decide where to spend and how to, you know, which side of the economy to uh, they, they want to spend money on. That's by definition decentralized. Uh, and to, you know, the Chinese policymakers and, and uh, often the scholar, they pride themselves on, on mobilizing resources to make big achievements, right? To do big things. Uh, and then 
giving money to consumers is not mobilizing resources to achieve big things. Um, and three, I think, as we discussed earlier, the Chinese government is very committed to a industry tech-driven growth. Uh, again, that requires the, the, the supply side stimulus they're used to and they know how to do. Uh, and uh, uh, that also explains why they are currently resistant to give, you know, basically giving households more money to spend. Uh, and then lastly, I think when they look around the world, they precisely don't want that kind of hyper-consumerized economy, you know, service dominant economy that Anglo countries often have. And they uh, want to avoid that kind of, you know, US style, highly financialized, high, uh, uh, consumer platform, company driven kind of growth. So Gucci and, and of course, you know that that results to the to what we talk about the the chronic overcapacity in the production and then the the various the kind of sluggish aggregate demand. Well, I'm going to come back to this because this, this also points to a political a core political issue about who the winners and losers are in in this in this system and who do they want want them to be. Uh, so Gucci san where where's the the source of of these challenges more in the policy side uh, of the ledger or more in these structural issues? I think both uh, structural side, uh, as for structural side, still uh, the uh, uh, downward adjustment of expected uh, growth rate uh, is huge. Uh, we also, we, we Japan also experienced the same thing in 1980s, uh, in the uh, first, uh, first half of uh, in 1980s. Um, at that time, um, uh, we believed uh, uh, we can, uh, we could uh, recover to uh, more than 5% growth rate uh, after uh, second and uh, first and second oil shock uh, in, in 1978 and 1973 and 1978. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, because uh, the era of high economic growth uh, ended uh, in 1970s, so we couldn't uh, reach 5% uh, uh, anymore. So, oh, 1980s, uh, 98, uh, 1980, 3 percent, 1981, 1982, all, all, all of them, uh, so uh, less than 4 percent. And uh, uh, and um, after recovery in 1983, it reached uh, 4 percent. But still, we couldn't uh, recover. Fact. Uh, so uh, it will take one or two years uh, to uh, to adjust such a new stage of the economic uh, uh, development. So uh, this is a structural problem. Second one is uh, um, this the disappointed uh, disappointing uh, policy made uh, caused by uh, published by the um, uh, Chinese government. So now everyone knows. Uh, um, uh, situation of the real estate market is very serious. So uh, we everyone need uh, everyone is waiting. Uh, so uh, capital injection, a small sign of capital injection to uh, real estate market, but uh, there is no sign. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, makes uh, disappointing uh, um, 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 exception uh, by many people. And second one. Um, private sector uh, business sentiment is also very bad uh, because uh, you know, uh, the Chinese government still put a great importance on uh, national um, security. Uh, so uh, uh, still um, everyone wait for the new uh, announcement about uh, the uh, change of order. Uh, not the, um, the priority, not on the uh, national security, but on the uh, economic development or private sector. If the Chinese government say so clearly, then everyone can uh, maybe able to uh, recover their mindset. So oh, there are two reasons of the uh, 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 policy uh, misallocation, um, I, I think. Uh, so both sides, structural side and the policy side, have uh, such a uh, reason. Okay. Um I'm going to come to Eunice next, but let, let, let me, because Eunice, you already touched about confidence to get us kicking off on that, but I'm going to come back to you first. Um, I want to ask about, because on Monday, the uh, legislative session starts, there have been rumors about a potential third plenum 
uh, which they have not oh. had yet, which usually focuses on economics. So if it were, if I want to tell you what I think would be helpful, and you all tell me <laughs> I'm like totally off the mark, wacko, uh, like way pie in the sky idealistic, or if I'm just, I'm an idiot and really they ought to do some other things. So, <laughs> I'm, and, and I'm going to partly, you know, I'm, I'm drawing a lot from what you all have said that if this is about generating sufficient demand, not just appropriate uh, enough production, a supply, which China's got plenty of supply across the board, then it seems to me a variety of things could be done at a big level. The hukou system, essentially eliminating the hukou system so that people could move throughout the country and uh, get access to services in cities, uh, and then they would be le need to save less and they could spend more if res if people who were born in the countryside could live permanently in cities. Uh, if you could find a genuine solution to local fiscal challenges, for example, instead of depending on the property sector to have a property tax. Uh, that sounds def uh, re uh, retractionary, but it might actually provide s uh, sources of, of funding. If you could find a way to move extra profits that SOEs have into the hands of households and shift uh that that those funds there'd be more uh for households to spend if you um also uh took some high profile steps to identify successful private entrepreneurs as being uh as good people upstanding first class citizens deserving of respect as opposed to targets uh, people might think when they make their money, they don't need to save it. They might be willing to spend it if they're private entrepreneurs. Um, so those sound like some wacky ideas. These are my, these would be things that I might think they want to mention at the Lianghui or at the third plenum. Uh, am I totally off the mark here? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just let you, Eunice, Yenmei, Logan, Suguchi-san, Stephen, in that order. So Eunice, starting with you. Well, in terms of the consumption vouchers or handing money to people directly to households. Um, I've asked that question to a lot of people here and um, most of them say it won't work because people will just save the money <laughs> if it's if it is just because uh, it's a confidence issue. So in terms of the um, the private sector, when you're talking about the entrepreneurs who are held up as uh, shiny examples, that may or may not work. I think one of the concerns, and this is also touches on what suguchi san had said, is uh, that the confidence in the private sector is really low. And I think that is key to trying to stabilize the economy. So in the conversations that I have here with um, VCs or funds or other business people, um, the expectation that the leadership is going to change is really low. And um, when I ask them, oh, well, what, what would you like to see? They say, oh, there would have to be a rollback of these regulations. Uh, we would have to see um, repairing um, with the West uh, because it makes it easier easier for us to go global. Um, it um, that they're they're generally concerned about the um, the idea of these detentions and that there should be a pullback, as Suguchi san had said, of the national security issues. So these are some of the things that that in my conversations here, people have said that they would like to see, but that they don't really think is going to happen. And um, and I think the the issue is that. Um, even if the government started to move in that direction, it would still take a lot of time to convince them that things are not going to change, that the confidence has already been eroded a lot within the private sector. So even if you were to hold up these entrepreneurs as shining examples, they're, I'm not convinced that they would think that that's going to stay. So for uh, that it's, it's, it's going to, to stick for some time. And, and that's, that's a, a big problem because in the past, uh, there, you know, I've had so many conversations with business people in the past who say, "Oh, yeah, well, oh, the you know market reforms, oh, they're going slow, oh, or things aren't going quite right." But you know, somehow China always figures it out, and um, it's the overall direction. Look at the overall direction of what's going on, and now that is not necessarily the case anymore. That there isn't a lot of confidence that the um, that the government is going to make the pragmatic decision that they're going to be always practical and and do what's best for the economy at the end of the day, and I think that is the crisis of confidence. 
Yeah, and May, what's uh, needed to change uh, people's sentiment and, and uh, churn that crisis of confidence around? No, Scott, I think you have the perfect recipe. I think you should be made the, the foreign, foreign expert <laughs> advisor number one. Um, but that's it. I think, but no, it, I, I, mean, I think economically, uh, what you said all makes sense. And I wholeheartedly agree that China should make those reform. But the difficulty with reform, uh, you know, you talk about it, it's, it's political, right? So with basically you provide a recipe of redistribution resources. And with that comes with decentralization uh, and redistribution of political power. Uh, so, for example, you talk about uh, transferring of uh, resources from SOEs to households, uh, and with that, the government will have to relinquish some of the levers of power, including, you know, uh, I think SOEs have been used as countercyclical uh, forces to provide, st uh, you know, stability, to provide employment um, in in certain downturns, and as well as they like to say, control the commanding height of certain economy, right? Controlling the pillars of the economy. Infra infrastructure, resources, power, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, so I don't think they're willing to relinquish those powers of lever. Uh, similarly, changing the fiscal arrangement, the tax structure will require changing the central local government relationship, uh, will require some of the levers that the central government has to basically bend the local government to their will will have to be lost. And I think at this point, Beijing is not willing to, to relinquish uh, those powers of lever. And with the household, uh, you know, the hukou reform, I think um, China has always been fearful of massive uprising in unrest in big cities. And they had a taste of that in 1989, right? Major, all big cities have pretty, um, you know, a massive uh, protest, uh, and they don't want that to happen again. So they always have that instinct to control city population, uh, and they want, um, and, and especially they don't want a, a big, a huge class of kind of like uh, very visible inequality in, in those cities. Uh, and uh, when I was in, living in Beijing, there was periodical policy of driving uh, this kind of rural migrants who are living on the fringes of the city, there could be very harsh policy to drive them out. I think some of the political fear would, were behind those movements. Um, so I think, you know, again, you know, Scott, economically, what you provided um, makes perfect per sense, but given the nature of the, of the political system, I'm afraid we have to wait. Well, let's see uh, if, if uh, we handed the ex foreign expert uh, number one baton to Logan, and he was uh, in in full control, and and uh, could have his uh, dream plan implemented. What would what would be uh, a couple of the elements of that plan? No, no, Scott, you have very wacky ideas. Uh, you know, these are exactly the ideas that were advanced by Beijing itself at and Chinese planners um, at the third plenum in 2013. Um, you know, over 10 years ago. And there was a far reaching, the 60 decisions of the third plenum plenary session in 2013 were a far reaching economic reform plan that called for improvements in efficiency and uh, f you know, putting the market uh, in a decisive role for resource allocation during that time. I think the key question and that Yenmei cites, which is, uh, you know, it, which is directly applicable here is uh, why has that um, why have those reforms backtracked? And we would argue that this is not a question of, you know, reluctant reform among um, the Chinese authorities. We would argue they tried many of these reforms and backtracked deliberately when seeing the economic consequences and market consequences of this. In other words, the leadership is not a, a, a set of reluctant reformers, but failed reformers. And that leads to very different consequences for in terms of how you think about where their option set is going forward. And I will just address very narrowly the fiscal aspects of this uh, so as not to uh, belabor this. Um, uh, Steve's organization, the International Monetary Fund, does us all a great service every year as they publish a Article 4 uh, document that contains um, sections that include the authorities' views of particular questions. And they typically always talk about fiscal policy. In preparing for the third plenum, which hasn't been announced, uh, we went back through the authorities' views section discussing fiscal policy for the last 15 years, every year since uh, the global financial crisis, and looked at the text of what China was saying every time. And it's very notable and revealing 
of how policymaking has shifted, because China's fiscal constraints are far more uh, are far more binding than people really understand, in, in my view. Um, fiscal revenue as a proportion of GDP is only 14 percent, 14.3 percent last year. Um, or uh, tax revenue as a proportion of GDP. If you include non-tax revenue, it's a couple percentage points higher than that. But this has declined very steadily since 2015. Why? Because China only collects tax on the investment-led growth model, the value-added taxes, enterprise income, ta enterprise income tax. They do not collect much tax on individuals, on individual income. That's only about 6% of their tax base, and it's only about 1% of GDP. And they don't collect much tax on domestic consumption, which is narrowly defined around, you know, alcohol, tobacco, uh, you know, electric vehicle or, or vehicles in general and other sort of specific uh, consumer items. So this has been a known problem that your tax base is too narrow. And if you're going to have a transitioning and rebalancing economy, you need a different tax base. You need a different tax system to evolve into this. The IMF has helpfully raised this issue with Chinese authorities virtually every year. Um, you know, in some respect. Um, and there's always some response. And the responses were always generally, until recent years, yes, we agree with you. Um, we need to eventually move toward a property tax. Property tax isn't the silver bullet here because on average, you know, property taxes only raise about 2% of GDP. You know, if you look across the OECD, and just to put that 14% number of tax revenue in context, the OECD average is about 34%. Um, the U.S. is about 26, 27 percent, if I if if I recall. So this is very low um, in terms of what China actually collects in in tax revenue and their actual fiscal capacity. And the key point is, this year, when asked about how are you going to eventually unlock new sources of tax revenue, the response was basically, we have a modern tax system, we don't have a revenue problem. And this is just runs completely contrary to this entire run of the past decade in which China says. We have problems. We need to reform. We need to fix this. This is what I mean when I say the system is the economic policymaking system is impaired, and that these are real problems. I'll stop here, but uh, I'll stop here. But I think it's an illustrative example of Scott. You have great ideas, and uh, our foreign expert number one. And uh, the problem is that China's already tried to implement them and didn't like some of the consequences. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm going to come to Stephen in just a minute. I got Suguchi san first, but uh, I think you know where my question's coming. Um, uh, Suguchi san um, you, you get to control Chinese economic policy making. What's at the top of your priority list? Yeah, uh, so uh, um, in my view, uh, because um, they are facing a uh, uh, um, big adjustment of uh, expected uh, uh, growth rate, so uh, it's um, impossible to recover uh, in confidence in short term. Uh, it takes uh, at least one or two years. And if uh, um, the Chinese government uh, uh, um, um, adopt too fast uh, policies to recover that, then it will cause non-performing loan problem like uh, 2010, uh, 20, uh, 2009 or 2010. So uh, uh, it takes a long time. And in such a situation, uh, I think uh, um, they should uh, go back to uh, um, starting point. Uh, it means open door policy and reform, reform and open door policy. Uh, um, in the first stage of um, a, a President Xi, uh, a pre, pre, a Xi administration uh, in 2012 to 2017, they pushed forward uh, a privatization or a, a marketization uh, and SOE reform. Uh, so at that time, uh, reform uh, going on, were well, going on. But um, in the second stage, it, uh, after 2017, uh, because the Chinese economy faced a difficult situation, and in such a situation, uh, the Chinese government always use SOEs to stimulate economy. Uh, they don't have uh, uh, other uh, um, effective uh, means to to make that uh, economy recover. So uh, um, it caused uh, the uh, uh, opposite side uh, direction of the reform uh, of the first stage. So they need um, uh, private sector, uh, big, big, private sector vigorous um, driving force uh, from now on. Not, uh, in, in addition, because the uh, growth rate of the Chinese economy uh, went down, uh, go down, so 
or the uh, performance of SOEs should become very uh, serious, very, very seriously worse than before. So uh, the Chinese government uh, will know or uh, they cannot uh, depend on, uh, can, cannot rely on SOE anymore. So uh, they need uh, private sector power uh, from now on. So uh, still they should uh, go back to uh, uh, a start, starting point uh, um, the, um, so uh, announced in, in the third plenum in uh, 2013 or uh, the um, 11th um, uh, um, meeting, 11th meeting of uh, in 1978, uh, the starting point of Dan Xiaoping, uh, this is necessary a, a policy to uh, recover confidence of the Chinese uh, people. Stephen, Logan referred to the Article 4 reports, which he has read extremely carefully. You've got to participate in that process directly. Uh, give us a little sense of, of that process and uh, where you think the conversation with Chinese authorities are about uh, econo economic policy trajectory. Sure, yeah, and it's, it's great that Logan reads those reports so carefully. I think I had my name on from 2004 to 2015, you'll see my name on all the reports and 2020 to, to this year. So glad you're getting good use. And I think uh, some of those points and actually your original points, Scott, are, are well taken. If you read through the reports, who co reform property tax at the right time? I mean, we forget that there was a property tax pilot in 2011. Uh, and I think as Logan highlighted, a real strength of the IMF reports is we always have the authorities views. So you can see their reactions uh, to what we're writing. And I really think Logan's point on the emphasis on tax reform. You know, we have been raising this. I think we raised it very prominently in 2014-15. And then this year we had a whole chapter in a background paper on the importance of tax reform and a whole menu of options to increase uh tax revenue. So we we will keep arguing that, you know, we argue that you know China has fiscal space, but China also has a big need for fiscal consolidation. We have from 2025 to 2035, a 0.7 percentage points of GDP reduction in the deficit, as we define it, which is much wider than the government, uh, every year. So it's a 0.7 percentage point adjustment for per year for 10 years. And so, of course, if we're going to advise that, we have to put together a big menu of options. There's a whole chapter on tax reforms and how to do that efficiently. Uh, if I can make one comment, which actually Logan stole what I was going to say on the 2013 party plenum third party plenum. Since you led with the third party plenum, giving the market a decisive role, just real quick, one constant in our discussions with China is you know, as macroeconomists, growth in the long run is ultimately driven by total factor productivity. And the way to achieve that is giving the market a decisive role in the economy. So I know we're low on time, so I'll, I'll keep it short there. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, uh, I, Yes, they tried a variety of reforms uh, post-2012 and 13, but I'd call them fair-weather reformers instead of failed reformers, is that you have to stick with it uh, through thick and thin to, to get to the other side. It's not always easy, of course. These No one's suggesting policies that would just be a, a cakewalk, of, of course. Um, we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask one final question uh, to Logan and Yenmei, which is about the international implications. Unfortunately, we don't have time to get everybody to, to weigh in on this. What do you think the implications are for um, the rest of the world's economy as a result of China's challenges in terms of growth and in terms of policy response to China's challenges? Um, you've hinted at this a little bit at the beginning, but uh, are we seeing a vicious cycle that's necessarily a consequence of China's trajectory, or is there potentially a more constructive uh, pathway out of this, well, Logan, and then Yen Mei. Sure. I mean, Scott, just briefly, I think our concern, I think our concern, many uh, global economies concern, um, global policymakers concern at this point is that Chinese domestic demand is slowing and therefore not absorbing the huge increase in productive capacity that has expanded, particularly in sunrise industries, particularly in some of the industries that have benefited from Chinese industrial policy. And if that is going to drive disinflationary or deflationary pressures, it will contribute to deindustrialization. It will contribute to um, reductions in profitability for these industries globally. I think that's going to be an increasing that's going to be an increasing concern. 
And uh, the proof here will be in terms of the trade volumes themselves. And this, this is why I said at the beginning, you know, Beijing is going to need to demonstrate that uh, the trade surplus is coming in, even the goods trade surplus, if not just the broader current account balance, but the, um, you know, the goods trade surplus is, is narrowing, imports are rising, um, and that China is contributing to global growth rather than, you know, exporting some of its, its uh, exporting some of this production abroad. I think we're going to see, and we're already seeing a significant uh, global response to the to that threat. Yan Mei? I do see a period of pretty heightened trade frictions between China and, the, and other major industrialized countries. And here are several reasons. One, you know, Logan has elaborated pretty well. Um, on one hand, the Chinese domestic demand is pretty sluggish. So that also means China is consuming less of the rest of the world's goods. At the same time, because it is leaning even more on supply side stimulus and created all this over capacity, uh, which has pushed down the, manu the prices of manufactured goods. So that has created fear around the world of the industrialization and floods of chi cheap Chinese, uh, Chinese exports. Uh, and then second factor is the composition of Chinese trade with the rest of the world has changed. So it's one thing for European countries and the US to absorb Chinese steel and cement, you know, pretty low value add added, low tech, commoditized products. And it's another thing when they have to face the onslaught of Chinese electric vehicles, semiconductors, um, appliances, machinery. Um, and these are, you know, high value add added, high, uh, high tech, high complex, highly complex, uh, also have highly complex supply chains, um, potentially have national security implications. Uh, and then third, I think for quite a few decades, there were, there was some sort of implicit um, bargaining going on, which was liberal, you know, for China, uh, trade for political and economic liberalization. The, the understanding was that the developed countries, Western world, would use their market to power China's ongoing economic development, as long as China was on a trajectory of liberalization. And that explicit bargain is gone. There's no more expectation of China going in the liberal direction. Hence, the political impulse, the political justification for trade with China has been weakened. So for all these reasons together, I think I see, you know, pretty, pretty heightened trade tensions coming. I wish we had another few hours to spend with each of you <laughs> uh, to go over these issues. Um, but in the hour that we've spent together, um, we I've learned a lot. Uh, and I think the audience has too. The original question is China in the middle of the crisis. We've got a range of opinions from this is a sort of a more significant downturn than usual. Uh, but there's some promise over the medium term to we're already in the middle of a crisis. Uh, regardless, I didn't sense a lot of optimism in reaction to that that core question. There's uh, certain serious concerns about confidence, which is partly about structural issues, partly about uh, policy leadership and, and guidance um, and um, suggestions for what should be done. Um, actually, I think there's probably more unanimity here about what the policy trajectory ought to be, uh, but not a whole lot of confidence that that's what the policy will be. We will have a chance to learn about where China is headed in just a few days when they open uh, their annual legislative session on Monday uh, and Tuesday. And if they hold a third plenum and what they say, we will all be watching that carefully as well as what they do the rest of the year. And everybody tuning in today will be to continue to depend on this great group of experts to help us understand what is going on. So I want to thank uh, Stephen, Logan, Yunus, Suguchi-san, and Yenmei for joining us, enlightening us on the challenges. And we look forward to continuing our conversation with each of you, all of you who've been watching. Thank you very much for uh, watching today. And uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with all of you as well. Have a great day. Thank you.